Welcome to the New Books Network. Wars have always been fought in different ways, depending on not just the manpower available, elite professional armies to mass mobilisation of whole populations, but also on technological developments, all the way from medieval siege engines to modern fighter jets. Recent developments suggest that there is much more change to come quite soon as information campaigns, crime and subversion become weaponized in new ways. And Mark Gagliolotti has been thinking about the weaponization of everything, as his book title has it. So uh, welcome to you. Hello there. And your, your basic point is that military tactics are changing. And I thought maybe we could just start by looking at some of the areas where non-traditional military capabilities are being developed. So sort of new areas of arms races, if you like. And one of the obvious recent things, to, just with a, a, you know, a, a practical weapon, is drones, both both in the water and in the air. Yes. I mean, in some ways, look, actually, a, a drone is, is, is nothing really new. And unfortunately, that's going to be probably quite a leitmotif of this conversation, that there's new forms, old technologies. I mean, you know, how is a drone that different from, say, a, a V1 or V2 flying bomb of the sort that slammed into London during the Second World War? But it's precisely that what the, what the drone does is in terms of changing the nature of warfare in a way that, to be blunt, it takes human beings out of the equation on one end of the process. So if you have drones, it's not just that you can fire missiles or spot for your artillery or do whatever else, but it's also that you can do so relatively safely. All you are putting in is money whereas the targets may well actually be flesh and blood, blood human beings. And at a time when we are actually quite casualty averse, even within authoritarian regimes, that's a big deal. Another area that's a growth area, cyber disruption, which takes lots of forms, doesn't it? Doesn't it? So can you sort of take us through the range of activities that armies are now doing online in terms of weaponization? Well, the first thing to say is actually... In some ways, it blurs the d- distinction between armies and not armies in the sense of now we have national efforts which range from very, very specific battlefield effects that armies would manage. Let's say, for example, uh, spoofing GPS signals. You know, We have a lot of the use of GPS. I mean, there's a whole question as to how far people have forgotten how to use maps and whether that's a skill that needs to be re- recovered within militaries. The answer is yes. But also GPS satellite signals are used to... You know, basically send planes to where they should be, to send artillery attacks or missiles where they're meant to be and that kind of thing. So on the battlefield, you can spoof them. But given that even soldiers now also have their cell phones, we've also seen cases in which actually cell phones are tracked to identify where soldiers are, but also to send them disconcerting messages saying, you know, you're all going to die and maybe we should run away and whatever else. But the point is you have a whole spectrum of activities that are often actually not necessarily handled by armies, but by security apparatuses and so forth, all the way up to disrupting communications, creating chaos behind the lines, switching off power systems, messing with traffic lights even, just to create mayhem on the roads, or more generally, to try and crash individual in examples of technology within people's homes. I mean, now that we are living in a world in which everything is connected, and we're near enough at the point where the fridge will automatically order new groceries from a delivery service, well, that Internet of Things is in itself a, a massive vulnerability. So what this really means is that the old ideas of the battlefield have once again expanded outwards. I mean, we got used to it in the idea of you know, nuclear war where no one was really safe. But now there's all sorts of other ways in which every single individual in a target society is now a threat. And just to sort of spell that out even more, the, the, you know, one new area, I think, being militarised is ransomware, isn't it? Uh, perhaps you could talk us through that. And are there any others? I mean, it's fascinating what you're saying about these new vulnerabilities. Are there, are there others that we need to be aware of? Well, I mean, take ransomware. What's interesting about ransomware is not so much what it is but as who does it. I mean, basically, it's exactly where you have a, a cyber attack that, that locks down a, a system, presumably some critical system, whether it's accountancy or running a hospital or whatever else. And 
as you'd imagine from the term, then the, the, the owners are told, well, you know, we will unlock your system if you pay us a certain amount of money, usually in, in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Now, obviously, that creates disruption. But it's not necessarily a, a better form of disruption than just simply some malware attack, some cyber attack that actually just crashes the system full stop. What this really emphasizes, though, is a point that you sort of touched on in the introduction, is also the blurring of the lines between the, the warfighter and the organized crime gangster. Because often what happens is we see certain regimes like Russian, but also like uh, North Korean and others, who in some ways are trying to enlist criminals into their warfighting efforts. And rather than saying, look, you know, we will pay you, they're saying, we will offer you support and impunity as you go and carry out disruptive acts that you will enrich yourself from. So in some ways, if, oh, it's a slightly sort of um, extreme parallel, but it's a little bit like the old system of privateering, whereby essentially a pirate will be given a letter of mark and say, we will actually consider you to be a legitimate agent so long as you attack your, our enemy's ships. And it's much the same as that. It's now basically telling, telling the, the gangsters, as long as you pick the right targets, we will keep you safe. However, it, are, are these cyber attacks less effective than we think? I'm just, just wondering about Ukraine. I mean, Russia is meant to be at the forefront of cyber attack capability. And yet when the war began in Ukraine, for which Russia had had all the time in the world to prepare, we didn't really see hospitals closing down, electricity off throughout the country, um, transport networks, you know, aircraft, all the rest of it failing because of cyber attacks. It just made me wonder whether, you know, Russia tried to do that stuff, but actually couldn't really. Yeah, it's a combination of factors there. I mean, one is that attacks were indeed foiled. I mean, if nothing else, the Ukrainians have had basically eight years of getting used to this kind of non-kinetic struggle with Russia. And I mean, in some cases, it's that they have just defaulted to rather simpler, lower tech options, which are just impossible to hack. But it's also that they, they got used to, to resisting hacks. And they also had a lot of assistance from the West, it has to be said. But beyond that, this also speaks to the way that, in fact, this, this war was planned. I mean, it clearly was not actually planned long term. Although forces had been being built up from the basically the spring before, the actual decision to go seems to have caught a lot of people within the Russian security apparatus and the government as a whole as a surprise. I mean, there are ministers who basically learned about it at the same time we did. And cyber exploits are not something that you can just simply, you know, despite how it looks in the films, just simply have have some suitably sort of precocious nerd sit behind a keyboard and say, okay, I've I've broken into their you know, main power system, I'll shut it down now. You know, it takes a long time to prepare. And I think, again, it's, it's one of the many ways in which actually Putin's either short-term assumptions about what the, what the war was going to be, his belief that he didn't actually want to sort of trash the country because he thought he was going to easily take it over, and also the fact that, again, he decided at the last minute, meant that they weren't all kind of geared up for that. But, sorry, uh, I'm saying, I mean, just simply that, but the, the final point is, but you're absolutely right. I mean, there is a tendency to be apocalyptic. It's always whatever's new. We have a tendency to, to think, oh, my God, the, the world has changed. And it obviously lends itself to, you know, thick, fictionalized paperbacks of cyber war and such like. In practice, I mean, it has obviously sort of massive capabilities, but we have a tendency sometimes to understate the degree to which we are aware of this, that we build in all kinds of fallbacks and so forth within our own critical infrastructure. Just listening to you talking about the Russian decision-making process, it's a slightly incidental point, but it, it, it reminded me of an account I read recently of, of the um, Pakistani attack on India and Kargil. And basically, the, the, the Pakistani failure was largely down to the secrecy. It wasn't actually a late decision that caused it. It was that the senior leadership of the top three or four people in the army didn't even communicate. I mean, they literally didn't communicate to the, the, their own air force head that they were going to do it. Uh, you know, uh, so, so it wasn't that it was short term. It's just that no one knew about it. Yeah, I mean, there is a kind of delightful irony that uh, often the, the more secretive, untransparent and authoritarian regimes do end up getting caught as a result within the sort of the coils of their own paranoias and secrecies. Next area, 
being weaponized, and uh, you'll probably say there are pre-echoes of this, but it's intensifying maybe, culture. Yes, I think this is one of the really interesting areas. Um, in some cases, it's it's weaponized in ways to try and undermine another country, to make it feel less willing or able to involve itself in a conflict. But it's also weaponized, sort of directing towards your, your yourself. Um, in order to fight wars, you have to have people who are willing to fight them. And grudging and reluctant conscripts make the worst sort of soldier. And therefore, what we're actually seeing is a much, much more conscious effort, in some cases at least, to actually create the kind of cultural conditions which make people more willing to fight, or at the very least, more willing to see their you know, sons and brothers and, and husbands and boyfriends sent off to fight, or just simply accept the economic costs of it. I mean, this is going to be one of the interesting test cases about what's happening in, in Russia today. You know, we have this massive, frankly unprecedented, economic warfare campaign being waged against it, but also a, a cultural, a political one. And how far can the long-term propaganda campaign that the Putin regime has sought to, to build this notion that Russia is an embattled island, a fortress surrounded by people who just basically hate it and want to bring it down, and that therefore it's time for everyone to accept the, the, the costs of sovereignty and autonomy. You know whether that that will work. So you know weaponization of culture go, goes both ways. Yes, we see it in attempts to, for example, you know um, challenge other assumptions, whether it's the, the Russians trying to actually sort of impose their own view that Ukraine is not really a country onto the Ukrainians, or the Ukrainians pushing back and actually telling the Russians that they are acting just the same as the Nazis in World War II. So it, it's weaponized in, in an aggressive way, but also particularly in a sense of, of building up your own resources for the war. I guess we've all become familiar with this idea of soft power. Does it matter militarily that the United States, you know, that, that, that people in the Middle East and East Asia are, are watching Hollywood less and Turkish soap operas more? Does, does that matter in military terms? I mean, I think it does for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, one is the precisely the issues of, of, of interconnectivity of, of, of modern warfare. You know, you're also trying to ensure that your enemy does not have access to certain resources, does not have allies, can't sell whatever it produces, but also that it feels isolated. I mean, and it's, it sounds banal in an age when we're seeing sort of cities being battered by artillery fire and missiles and so forth. But, you know, again, morale is absolutely crucial. I mean, wars are ultimately contests of will rather than just simply materiel. They're about how much are you willing to suffer in order to get what you want. And if you feel isolated, if you feel that, that, that you do not have allies and friends, then that, that clearly has some impact. You know, I, I'd say some. So, you know, if, if one takes that issue about sort of do, do people want to look to, to, to Hollywood or, or elsewhere, I mean, I think it matters both as a symptom of what we could call in some ways the end of soft empire, but also it matters in the sense of countries that are turning their back on that particular sort of cultural product may well also be more willing to, I don't know, see their financial institutions being used as uh, you know, for sanctions, busting monetary flows by Moscow, let's say. Yeah. What about um, NGOs? I, I guess NGOs and think tanks, are, are they being weaponized? I mean, to an extent, and look, and look, there's a danger. I mean, I, I should stop, actually. I mean, I use weaponization in the title of the book in some way slightly tongue-in-cheek because there is a risk of saying that you know, anything can be weaponized um, from, from football hooligans onwards. And obviously, when, when everything is weaponized, then nothing is weaponized. When it comes to, to NGOs and think tanks, I mean, they, they also have a role, I think, in the assembly of the kind of cultural conditions for war fighting. They are about, you know, can you present a, uh, a view of the world that, that compels either the elite or the country as a whole 
to be willing to take the costs of war, to be willing to actually sort of get involved, or conversely, can you actually use them to fragment opinion, to distract and to divide and to demoralize such that a country is not really in a position to be able to maintain an extended contest of will and resources. So in a way, everybody from, from newspapers and Instagram influencers, for heaven's sake, all the way through to venerable think tanks can ultimately play a role in this. I, mean, I don't want to end up being a, a, a greater defender of your title than you, uh, but, but it does seem to me that there is a change in, in, in the use of NGOs from, you know, the British Council or the you know, other equivalents in the old days promoting British literature, yeah, British culture, to the use of NGOs in, you know, in Kiev in the last decade, maybe in some of the Middle Eastern countries, is quite aggressively being used to bring down regimes and, and, and achieve much more directly political goals. Well, if we go back to the height of the Cold War, to be honest, I, I think you'll find that a lot of the sort of soft power outreach that the West did into the Soviet Union was very much calculated with an idea that this was actually going to undermine the, the, the narrative, the confidence, and the, the overall sort of grip on the national imaginary of the Communist Party and you know, Marxism, Leninism, and, and such like. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a bit of a sort of jokey cliche about the extent to which the Soviet Union was, was brought down by, by genes and rock and roll. But there is some truth to that. So, I mean, I, I think, to be honest, cynicism is not a new invention. Um, you know, even as we have institutions that do indeed have very positive roles in terms of just simply saying, this is what we regard as the best of our cultural output and we would like to introduce it to the world. It's very rare that people do that just simply out of the kindness of their heart without actually thinking, no, this is going to give us some kind of political weight. Yep, fair point. And uh, what about narcotics? Uh, the 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 use of the drugs trade. I mean, it, it, yeah, the drugs trade is massive, isn't it? And and probably, uh, yeah, underappreciated as to how much it affects the world. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't get mentioned much in the business pages of the newspapers, but probably should. It is, yeah. I mean, this is it. I mean, and, and let, let's be perfectly honest. We, we we've had liquidity crises in in global economies that, frankly, would have probably sort of let seen the, the global economies log jammed had it not been that it was continued to be lubricated by a, a rich flow of drug money being laundered through its institutions. So yes, we, we, we need to give thanks to those public spirited drug lords. Yeah, I mean, I think it, that really fits into the wider issue of the degree to which criminal e economies as a whole are, and I would suggest this is one area which, which is definitely increasingly evidently being used as instruments of, of trade craft between states. I mean, you know, there, are, there are many conflicts around the world from Afghanistan onwards in which actually drug trafficking, drug trade played an absolutely crucial role. And we, we tend to think of them simply as, as political insurgencies and counterinsurgencies. But there's always that third dimension, whether we're looking at uh, the Turkish campaign against the Kurds, whether we're talking about, well, a whole variety of Latin American conflicts, or as I say, Af Afghanistan. And, and we, we need to be basically sort of factoring in the criminal dimension more directly, but specifically in in terms of how how states can use this, it tends to be sort of used in 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 various ways. You've got countries such as say North Korea. Now North Korea, you know, with its economy is in terrible state. Well, it has created Bureau Thirty Nine, which, for want of a better description, is essentially the Ministry of Organised Crime. And amongst their various activities, I mean, they, for example, still you know, were sort of famous for producing the best counterfeit $100 bills, simply because they were being produced on government printing presses. But likewise, they also produce huge amounts, particularly of methamphetamines for trade to Japan and, and elsewhere in Asia to bring in money to help keep this, this country afloat. So, you know, in some cases, you actually almost have it as, as a, another part of the national budget machinery. In other cases, what happens is because you have this sort of 
global cross-connection of criminal traders. And it's worth noting criminals tend to be the, the true internationalists. They are much, much more likely to make deals across national, ethnic, and even religious boundaries than anyone else. Um, and as we saw, for example, until really the invasion, Russian and Ukrainian gangsters were cooperating perfectly comfortably, despite the fact that their countries were at an undeclared war at each other. Well, I mean, this, this kind of alternative networks become things that, that, that can be used, whether it's to sort of smuggle goods, whether it's to taxed in order to, to raise funds for subversive operations, or even sometimes for muscle. And again, I mean, because I'm primarily a Russianist, I'll, I'll go back to, to a Russian example. But I mean, we've seen gunmen in Crimea recruited as additional kind of auxiliaries during the seizure of the peninsula in 2014. And we have seen organized crime being used to carry out assassinations and espionage operations across Europe since then. So, I mean, I think this is, it just simply creates a whole new array of instruments that a state can, if it chooses to, turn to. Well, yes, um, but not just drugs. I mean, I also, I mean, for example, sometimes you need to get people across borders. Well, who's particularly good at doing that? It's human traffickers. Um, you know, this is a, a whole variety of, of these criminal trades which, which are useful. But when it comes to drugs, I mean, because it is so genuinely global, because it is on such a massive scale, and because in some cases it is so intertwined with, with, with local, if not national governments, it, has, it offers particular opportunities precisely for intelligence agencies of ev every stripe, if we're honest biological war now we've we've all faced the pandemic and i think there are you know quite a number of people who believe it can't just have been a coincidence that it started in wuhan where there happens to be a biological weapon facility or some kind of uh, you know institute that develops these kind of things uh, how n important is that i mean again you'll say it's not new but uh, you know there are new dimensions to it probably yeah, I'll be honest. It's, I mean, my expertise is not so much in the whole weapons of mass destruction uh, field. And, and biological warfare itself, I mean, actually, it is a massively difficult and unpredictable weapon to harness. And if anything, all the more so these days, because we've got so used to high speed and relatively easy traffic between countries and indeed regions that you know people do move a lot and therefore it's, it's actually be very very hard to unless you begin to as people are sort of apparently working on develop biological weapons that only target particular ethnic groups or the like but otherwise you know basically one, once you use it you know that you can't control it so i think it's, it's not actually that i i, I really see that uh, these kind of nightmare weapons are more likely to be used. But what I think is quite striking, though, is the degree to which actually mass, sort of, so I say, health and other sort of emergencies can themselves become employed. I mean, if we think of, of COVID, you know, this was a genuinely global pandemic, but it created opportunities for, for example, um, you know, leveraging your power in terms of certain countries sought to to buy soft power by donating you know, protective equipment and vaccines. It was used exactly as a weapon of trying to mobilize national populations by blaming others. It was used as a way of imposing greater controls in authoritarian regimes and justifying that. And it was even used for attempts at some rather sort of crude soft power, like when, when the Russians had their so-called From Russia With Love medical missions to Serbia, Italy, and even the United States. So I think it, it, I wouldn't necessarily want, want to dwell on, on biological weapons as such, but the degree to which actually you know, mass nat natural and unnatural disasters alike can become opportunities for these kind of covert statecraft and power plays yeah i i i, I fully f fully take the point but it does occur to me that if you're a military strategist in beijing or moscow or washington or wherever watching the pandemic you'd think just as you say it's so global it it's yeah it wasn't very effective as a weapon you draw the conclusion let's not do that 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we have to acknowledge again in terms of the sort of spillover effects. And look, I, I have no belief that this, this was in any way a biological weapon. But you know, if you were thinking, well, what lessons can be learned? I mean, the interesting thing is, for example, the degree to which even though the Chinese used some extraordinary draconian measures to try and ensure that they themselves did not suffer as badly, but the impact on the global economy clearly had a massive knock on effect to, against China. So yes, again, I, I think you know, the, the interconnectivity of the modern world, which is a sort of central theme of my book, is one that actually mitigates against that kind of weapon. One last uh, area of, uh, I think, weaponization, uh, which is a very interesting passage in your book, which was lawfare, as you call it, L-A-W fare. And you had a very good example of, of how, I think it was the UK used laws against Russia in, with Lloyds of London, wasn't it? Well, I mean, that that was the, the the glories of using insurance, the insurance market, and yes, the, the laws around that was when there was a Russian flagged ship um, you know, years ago that was actually taking well, what was presumed to be taking uh, embargoed military equipment to Syria to support the, the brutal regime there, and it was making sure that it kept out of uh, national waters and so forth. And so people were racking their brains as to what to do about it. And obviously, you know, if, if this were a film, then there would be some suitable spy or commando who deal with it. But instead, it was just simply a case that a word was had with the relevant uh, insurer or reinsurer at Lloyd's of London that said, actually, you know, are you aware that you're insuring a ship that may well be involved in sanctions busting? And by the way, are you aware that that's illegal? And therefore, the insurance was, was revoked. And because it's a very, very foolhardy thing to actually sort of send a, a merchant ship at sea without any insurance, that ship then sailed back. So again, yes, this is it. Through through the law and something as seemingly mundane as insurance industry, um, actually a sort of uh, a potential major arms shipment to to Syria was was, was turned around. And I think more, more more generally, again, because we do live in an age of international, national and economic laws that that do constrain us in all kinds of different ways, and yet which we all have to follow because we all have a stake in the global commons, that does become something that can actually be used. And it's one of the the strengths of the West, which up to now, and again, this is something that obviously China is trying to, to rewrite, but up to now, you know, essentially, these have all been written by, and I would suggest for, the West. Let, let, let's move on to the more general arguments then. And uh, I'm very struck by what you said earlier, that if, if everything's weaponized, nothing is weaponized. It doesn't seem to me that's right. I mean, if, if everything's weaponized, then you can argue that you know, law, culture... Uh, NGOs, all this, are being weaponized to a far greater degree than before. I mean, I take your point, a lot of this has has historical precedent, but nonetheless, something on the scale seems to be new. Then that does take us into a new era, doesn't it? Well, it's a new era, but I said, I think it's it's defined not so much just by, oh, this is weaponized now and this is weaponized now. I mean, the, the, the basic thesis of the book is that war of the old-fashioned kinetic variety has become increasingly expensive and increasingly counterproductive. That, you know, it, it's not just that, that modern kit costs ridiculous amounts extra. It's also that the, the, the political costs of, of, of war are that much greater. And in an age of interconnected economies and the fact that a lot of the, the real assets one looks for are not physical ones, you know, you, you could not, um, you know, just simply invade Silicon Valley and expect somehow to acquire all the technological and entrepreneurial knowledge there, any more than if you took the square mile of the city of London, you suddenly control all the money in those banks, because it's no longer, it's, it's a virtual commodity. So I think, you know, in, in this era, actually, war fighting seems to be, well, is actually becoming less common, but is also much, much less effective. But all the various tensions and rivalries haven't gone away. So my argument is precisely that they, they bleed into new realms, and particularly the interconnectivity of the modern world itself becomes a battlefield. Now, the irony is that then this comes out, and then shortly thereafter, Putin invades Ukraine, which at first I was thinking, well, that, that seems to invalidate my argument. But 
on actually sort of uh, closer observation, it's clear that in fact, Putin should have read my book because he was in effect winning up to the point at which he invaded. He had built this massive force up on Ukraine's borders, which was acting as a tool of coercive diplomacy and coercive economics. Under the shadow of a potential Russian invasion, no one really wanted to invest in Ukraine. The Ukrainian economy was in crisis. It was almost impossible for it to access international finance. And you had a constant flow of Western great and the good to Moscow, giving giving Putin precisely that kind of centrality that he craved to try and sort of petition him not to invade. And indeed, certain Western governments were trying to bring pressure to bear on Kiev to give concessions to Russia. The point at which he actually started to invade, in some ways, is the point at which he started to lose. And I think, you know, in many ways, this conflict, regardless of the outcomes, I mean, demonstrates the the colossal risks in using military force, just as the situation before the invasion demonstrated that even a country like Russia, which is, after all, relatively poor, but nonetheless could, could leverage its assets, which in this case meant its military, and use that to non-kinetically bring massive pressure to bear on on another country. I'm currently uh, making some programmes about the collapse in confidence in the American electoral system and trying to trace some of that back to Russian activity in 2016 to a lesser degree in 2020 in terms of uh, undermining confidence in the machines, in the processes, in the whole way the elections are done. And, you know, if, if it is that the 2024 election is basically doesn't produce a legitimate president, which seems to be a distinct possibility, that will have been an extraordinary, extraordinarily cheap way of, of undermining an adversary. Except, of course, the interesting thing is I'm not convinced that initially that was necessarily Russia's goal. I mean, broadly speaking, it, there's no question, but that Russia has engaged yeah, primarily since 2014 in a campaign that you know, some call hybrid warfare. I think it's actually a very problematic term. Personally, I prefer the, the formulation of George Kennan, the, the veteran American scholar diplomat and architect of the early Cold War strategy adopted in, in Washington, who talked about political warfare that in effect is the use of every means short of actual warfare, legal and illegal, overt and covert, to bring about national goals. And I think this is clearly what, what Russia has been waging against the West. And actually, ironically, more in, in Europe than in America, with the particular aim of dividing, distracting and demoralizing. In the American case, I mean, I think it's more that in fact, the, the Russians were terrified by the prospect of Hillary Clinton being elected. Rightly or wrongly, they believed that she was sort of antithetical to that to their sort of continued existence. That she would push America into essentially launching a campaign to try and undermine or even sort of uh, topple the regime. And they also essentially thought that she was an absolute shoe in. But it's really a bit, of, a bit of mirror imaging. You know, they assumed that American democracy was every bit as manipulated and government controlled as their own. So in that circumstance, I think they were just trying to basically light as many fires as possible so that, you know, when she was elected president, she would be too busy dealing with them to be able to kind of mobilize the sort of national constituency for a campaign against Russia. So they were supporting all kinds of disruptive forces and actors, left, right, um, you know, it, it didn't really matter. And obviously, you know, in that respect, Trump, well, if you're looking for a disruptive actor, it's hard to get better than that. But again, I think it's worth noting that I, I don't think either that they thought that Trump would be elected. I mean, certainly the people I was talking to in the Russian foreign ministry were, were, were astonished when that happened. But also that I don't think they had a kind of a, a grand strategy of, of undermining democracy at that first point. This was very much just simply about Hillary Clinton. The point is that when it was framed in those terms, in America itself, I think maybe that that's actually the point at which various act figures in, in Russia started to think, huh, okay, actually this, this can be a systemic attack. There is a, a sort of strange and perverse feedback loop that in many ways was in effect. Maybe, yeah. Uh, well, you'll have to wait for the programmes. I, 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 I suspect there was 
you know, maybe not very widespread in the Russian system, but there were people who did see uh, in Moscow the advantages of messing around with the, with the electoral process itself. And that, you know, there were many other things going on, just as you described, but that uh, one of them was an effort to either disrupt or create an impression of disruption of of actual vote counts and uh, registration lists and so on. But we'll, 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 we'll wait till it's coming out in October and uh, we'll wait till then. But what, what I did, the reason I raised the issue actually was was whether... You think the West is doing it uh, is doing similar things to to Russia because it seems to me that they may not be. I mean, I don't, is is there any any effort to create the kind of disruption in Russian society that the Russians have created in American society? Not on anything like this, the same sort of scale. I mean, it's for all sorts of reasons. One is that, that kind of disruption tends to be a weapon of the weak. And although it may seem sort of strange to be describing Russia in those terms, you know, we, we have to appreciate the extent to which it is vastly weaker on pretty much any index of power than the West. Secondly, obviously, Russia is an authoritarian regime, not a, an out and out tyranny quite yet, though it's it's nudging more and more that way. But therefore, you just simply there are that many fewer outlets for that. But on the other hand, I mean, let's not be naive. I mean, look, the, the, this current campaign. I mean, as I said, I, I described it as economic warfare. I mean, this is in part intended to deny Russia the capacity to maintain and rebuild its military machine, surely. But of course, it is also directly intended to disrupt the Russian political elite and to undermine the legitimacy of the system with ordinary Russians. I mean, that, that, that's pretty obvious. And it, and it comes with a sort of a, you know, a wider campaign. It clearly, there is disinformation at work. I mean, although to, to a large extent, and I, I don't blame them in the slightest, but the Ukrainians are proving quite masterful in the use of information warfare against Russia, spreading and magnifying all kinds of divisive rumors about everything from attempted coups to Putin's health or whatever. It's not as though there there is not also a, a, a Western role in these campaigns. Um Generally speaking, look, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of what we're talking about is open to to great de- degree of subjectivity. You know, our soft power is the other side's uh, wicked attempt to impose their own values. Um, so yes, of course, the, 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 this is going on. Every state does this, and you know, even states that are notionally friends and allies to a degree, are involved in contests over, over trade deals, over you know, norm setting and, and such like. You know, this goes on. Finally, then, let's look at your um, ideas about how to defend against uh, some of the trends you've been describing. And you, you, you've got three words you use, resilience, actually four, resilience, awareness and public vigilance. Yeah, I think, again, it's this notion of what is the best way to to resist these kind of things. And given that essentially such attacks take place along lines of least resistance, uh, there is a temptation to think in terms of deterrence. Oh, well, if people attack us, then, then we must fight back. Well, that works so long as you notice that you're being attacked and you know who is attacking you. But, you know, when it's things like, for example, cyber attacks that can be sort of launched and bounced through a whole variety of different jurisdictions, or even if it's things that don't necessarily even look immediately like attacks, such as, for example, attempts to sort of foist cultural values, you know, is the presence of the Confucius centers, the sort of Chinese cultural institutes, is that an attack or is that a legitimate expression of soft power? Well, really, you know, everyone can make their own decision. But so in that respect, sort of deterrence by, by sort of counterattack doesn't really work. So often we're really left with deterrence by denial, which is essentially convincing the other country, the other power, that it's not worth making an attack. It's not worth the resources and the risks involved because it's not going to work. So it's often about just simply shoring up our own defences. It's, it's not about, I mean, there's, there's a great, uh, for example, 
passion at the moment for so-called myth-busting organizations that take disinformation and then blast out, no, this is why it's wrong. And I understand why particularly bureaucracies like that, because it sort of lends itself to metrics. We busted 47 myths last week and we're going to bust 53 this week. But in practice, they don't really seem to work. Because the kind of people who are going to be will, more willing to believe some kind of foreign disinformation narrative than their own government are not likely to change their mind because suddenly a government-funded institution tells them that they're wrong. No, it's actually addressing why are they so willing to believe the foreign narrative and not their own. It's actually about identifying you know, communities that, that feel marginalized and, and disempowered groups that actually think that somehow their own system is incompatible with their values. It's also about all other kinds of, of resilience, you know, from actually having computer systems that are, are properly secured to financial systems that can't easily be manipulated. It's about the boring stuff. It's about making sure that we know where certain amounts of money came from and who owns what property and what companies. It's all about this essentially defensive activity and because governments will usually only do what they actually have to do, the public comes in in that we have to push our governments to, to do this. It's not interesting, it's not exciting, and often it will cost money, but ultimately it will protect us, and we are the ones that have to hold our politicians' feet to the fire. We can't just simply complain about, you know, for example, corruption, and yet keep electing corrupt figures yeah but it's, if we think yeah. this is important we do it it's interesting you you, you say this now I, I when i when i read the book and just listening to you now i did wonder about this that you, you talk about the pub you use the phrase public vigilance in the book and you're telling me you know the public must be aware of all this stuff and they must hold politicians to account on it but you also said that there is a collapse in confidence in some of these societies and the public is no longer homogenous really is it i mean if you if you go back to world war 2 you know in the in the britain absolutely yeah, 99% 100% were on the same side uh, that that will no longer be true in future conflicts and adversaries know it and are recruiting segments of let's say american public opinion to oppose you know fundamental things about their own society. So does that mean that the reliance on public vigilance is, is a bit flawed because there's no public? My view is that on the whole, foreign actors very rarely actually have the capacity to, to kind of change people's minds. They have no magic mind control powers. What they are able to do is take advantage of the groups that already feel disenfranchised and, and avoided. And I think this is one of the problems we, we've got with, with modern democracy. And I appreciate this sort of conversation now sort of is broadening out massively. But, you know, you cannot, again, to take a very specific American example, call people a basket of deplorables and then expect to win them over. I mean, you know, we actually have this case where we, we too often see electoral mathematics that more or less says we can afford to write out this particular proportion of the electorate, because that will strengthen our support with the rest. And that is enough to, to win the vote. Well, that's perfectly true. That may well win your majority in parliament or a presidency. But on the other hand, if you continue to sort of play these kind of polarizing political games, of course, that very process of polarization is going to create national vulnerabilities. So I think this is this is where it comes to. And look, it's, it's not a simple fact of either we need better leaders or we need better publics and electorates. And clearly the, the one connects with the other. There is room for serious national leadership. And there is also room for us to all take more ownership of this process. And rather than just simply saying, why aren't we being protected when something goes wrong, when there's some terrible cyber attack or whatever, we should also be thinking, oh, what are we doing? And it's worth noting that actually, you know, if one looks at countries that have regarded themselves as much more frontline states, Finland is the usual sort of poster child, but one can also look at the Baltic states and, and, and several others. There actually one does see a much greater sense that there is a national commitment. You know, you raise the example of, of World War II. Well, the thing about World War II was precisely that everyone could immediately feel that they were under threat and they, they knew what they were fighting against. Part of the problem is, you know, in, in, in the modern era, there is often not going to be a, a clear sense of, of threat. Um, you know, is if, if, if a hospital in the other side of the, of the country 
um, is crashed by ransomware, you may not really think it is anything to do with you or anything to do with international relations. And in that respect, actually leadership, the willingness to actually create a compelling narrative that actually explains how these things are connected matters. So I said, I mean, you know, there is no easy answer. I mean, in a way, part of the point I make is actually, unfortunately, the real answers to these challenges are slow, incremental, and tedious. They're procedural and cultural. There is no one way you suddenly sort of fix it all. But nonetheless, the key thing about the book is to really to start the debate. I mean, I'm sure there are people who have massive issues with all kinds of specific assertions I make. I mean, the book deliberately is a very sort of wide ranging one, but that's the whole point. I'm fine with people to disagreeing with it. The key thing is we need to be talking about it. Yeah. Difficult time to be a general or an army chief. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you very much indeed, Uh, Mark Galliotti. Very interesting book, and we're very grateful for you uh, talking us through it. My great pleasure.